God bless you. Oh my God. There is nothing like being in the presence of God. Today, we're going to have a special, special teaching with you and I while I'm home relaxing. But if you are liking this content, before I get into this, I need everyone to hit the like button, hit the like button. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, hit the subscribe button. And I need everyone to share this to five people. I don't care. Share it with a friend and an enemy. Share it with a friend and an enemy because today we're going to be talking about something very interesting. Understanding prophetic signs. This is probably one of the most one of the most powerful teachings that I'm going to be doing because I'm going to be teaching you how to decode the Word of God and how to pull the revelation out of it. So the Bible is a book that has an exoteric, which deals with the outer layer or the realm of the, of, of the carnal. So it has an exoteric meaning, and then it has an esoteric meaning. So when we read the Word of God, there are two meanings that we have to decode. And somewhere in able to decode the exoteric with the esoteric is where you're able to get the revelation of the Word of God. I'm going to be talking a little bit about understanding prophetic signs, iconography, and symbology in the Word of God. And once you're able to understand it in the Word of God, you'll also be able to understand it in your own life because everything that is going on with us believers are symbolic to what the Word of God is saying. I want you to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button because we are going to be getting deep in this. We're going to be talking about this. And I'm also going to get into understanding the end time signs. You know, we are in the end times. The things that we are witnessing we know from the Bible of what the Word of God says. I'm going to be talking a little bit about it, and I'm going to be talking about not only the exoteric, but I'm also going to be talking about the esoteric aspect of it. Go ahead, click the like button, hit the subscribe, and if you're watching me, I'm going to put something in the chat room here, and I'm going to say, God bless you, and I love you guys. Put your first name and your name, and tell me where you're from. We have people watching from India. We have people watching from all over the world, New England, London, Kenya, Ghana, South Africa. Oh my God, the precious saints all over the world. Well, so put your name in, put where you're from, what city in the U.S., America, because today we're going to be talking about something very, very powerful. Father, I ask you right now, my God, I just felt a wind of the Spirit, a wind of the Spirit. Manaraba shata maha ha, itiki shata. Father, and so, Father, we ask you right now, soften their hearts to receive from you, Lord. Oh, God, you're worthy. Oh, God, you're worthy to be praised. You're worthy to be honored. And so, Lord, we take our authority now in the mighty name of Jesus, and we soften our hearts to hear your word. We soften our hearts to get a word from you, Lord. And Father, we ask you right now to bring total salvation to anyone that's watching me, to their loved ones. I just feel an urge right now as a sign, Lord, to it for them. This I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen and amen. Now, in understanding the prophetic iconography in the Word of God, every character in the Bible has also a symbology of the Christ. And somewhere in understanding the symbology of the Christ, you are able to understand the esoteric meaning. For example, when we talk about Abraham, who is the father of the faith, Abraham has the symbology of the Christ to the iconography of taking his son, who really was the son of the promise and needing to sacrifice him and God provided a ram in the thicket. This is the iconography of the son of God and the father providing the lamb which is the son of God to be slain for us believers. It is the same thing 
that we see with Jacob and Esau. Jacob being the one that is not likely or should not have the blessing. Esau being the one that humanity or that the, or that the earthly part chooses. And Jacob receiving the blessing, which is an iconography of the first Adam who came first and the second Adam, okay? So every story has a spiritual meaning of the Christ when you read it with an esoteric type of point of view and not the exoteric aspect of this. Now, there's three keys in understanding prophetic Bible prophecy. There are three major keys, and you might want to write this down. Number one, there are specific signs, heavenly and earthly, that will occur. So when we understand Bible prophecy, we understand that there is symbology that is sown in the heavens as well as the earth. Remember, the heavens and earth reflect each other. This is why in the Lord's Prayer, you hear the Bible says, on earth as it is in heaven. The earth represents the kingdom. Okay, you're going to hear me use terminology while the heavens represents the kingdom. Okay, so the reason why we say the earth represents queen, queendom, because earth or matter is feminine. Okay, I'm going to get a little bit into this and I'm going to talk about this because this might be a little mystical, but I'm going to get into that for those that have an air, the dogmatic Christians, bye-bye. But those that are ready for the deeper stuff, let's get into it. So the earth is the kingdom, and it comes from the Latin to mean matter, okay? So this is where we get the word mother earth, right? Matter comes from the Latin mother. So when we see the earth, the earth is the kingdom; It is feminine, while the heavens represents the kingdom. So in the Old Testament, we see where everything is about developing the queendom. Everything is about to de is about developing the outer aspect, the outer aspect. And this is seen through the Judaic law. This is why the laws, the laws had everything to do with more so the outer aspect. The Ten Commandments mostly had to do with honoring God and honoring the queendom or ad honoring this dimension. It is not until Christ begins to come that he begins to teach us to come back to the kingdom and to begin to come back within. During the days of Moses, Moses builds the temple and teaches them the temple on the outside. He builds the temple, the outer court, the inner court, and the holies of holies. When Christ comes, Christ begins to teach us and reveal to us that our bodies is the temple. So the kingdom is to reflect the kingdom. And this is seen through the microcosm, which is the human body, and the macrocosm, which is the earth. Very important that we understand that. So. Number one, we understand specific signs on heavenly, heavenly or known as the heavens, and as well on the earth will occur. This is one of the first things that we need to understand in understanding prophetic Bible prophecy and prophetic symbolism. Number two, we know that there are certain shakings and specific shakings that represent transitionary periods. Now, I want to get into this because when we come under attack, and when you understand it in the Bible, when you look at this, when we come under attack, they're usually for three different aspects. Attacks are either seasonal, transitional, or dimensional. Oh, God, that's good. Thank you, Father. Let me say it again. They're either seasonal, okay? So sometimes we go through things for a season. Number two, they're transitional, okay? You remember where Mary was not in Bethlehem and the Lord uses, uses the emperor or Caesar to throw taxes to get her into the, in the right place of so their transition. Sometimes the Lord allows tax to come through transitions. And number three, they're dimensional. When, God, when the devil came and attacked Job, it was because it was a dimensional attack. God was using the attack of Lucifer to bring him into another dimension. The same thing with Jesus. In the garden, when Jesus begins to attack him, it was dimensional. So number two, we understand in prophetic iconography that you have to be able to discern whether or not the attack is seasonal, dimensional, or transitional. And you have to know this for your life. Someone type that in the chat room. So there's three reasons why. And most of the times, if you don't discern it and you make it personal, you miss the whole thing, people. Oh, they just don't like me because they don't like me at my job. Oh, they just have an attitude with me. Someone, one of my, one of my blessed partners, type that in the chat room for me. Bless your heart. So they're either transitional seasonal or dimensional. 
And most of the time, you have to be able to discern it, but you cannot discern it if you're looking on the out, outer part. This, you can only discern it when you come within. That's number two. And number three, there will be specific signs that represent, that seal covenant. That's another part. So we know in the Bible that there are seven major covenants. I'm not going to go through all of them because each of them is a message on its own, but we know the Adamic covenant. We know the Abrahamic covenant. We know that there is a, Mos a Noahic covenant. We know that there is also a Davidic covenant. We know that there is also the Palestinian covenant or the Promised Land covenant. We know that there's also the New Covenant. So there's all these different covenants that are in the Word of God. And so we must understand that the third sign represents covenant, relationship with the kingdom or with the Father. Now, when we understand the Word of God, to decode the Bible prophecy or to decode prophetic symbolism in the Bible, because the Bible does not only tell us of what happened in the past, but the Bible also can foretell us what's going to happen in the future. Now, I've never taught this, and this is going to be very, very deep, but the Bible is one of the most mystical, mystical, fascinating literatures that if you understand it, you can discern things and predict things, and it is very prophetic. And this is what the prophets knew how to do, and this is why I'm teaching you this. Now, to decode the prophetic symbolism in the Bible, you have to understand that there are three steps. Number one, information. Number two, inspiration. And number three, revelation. When we talk about information, this deals with you understanding the word and reading the word so that you're able to have knowledge. So the informational part of the word of God deals with the letter. Now, the letter of the word does not have power. This is why Paul or the apostle, also many others in the scripture, it says the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. If you just look at the letter of the word, you are taking it on the exoteric. And this is what births out a spirit of religiosity. You meet people that have a spirit of religiosity. And you see them also during the days of Jesus. You can't do this on the Sabbath today. You can't wear your hair in a bun. You're going to hell. I mean, just crazy stuff. You can't chew gum. You're, you can't do this. You, you're a man. You can't wear the color pink. I mean, you hear this and it's such stupidity. It's such stupidity. These are people that wrestle with the spirit of religiosity. And I'm going to explain something to them. You never want to get in an argument with them. You're a woman. You can't wear pants. You're a woman. You can't you can't, you can't stand in church and preach because as a woman, that's not of God. And this is a spirit of religiosity. It is a stronghold. And one of my teaching, I go deep on where the spirit of religiosity is at. And you see a spirit of religiosity, especially in the Muslim faith as well, which of course they do not serve Yeshua. So here, as we get into this knowledge of the word, okay? Information has to graduate into knowledge. And as it graduates into knowledge, and as you read the Word of God for information, so there's sometimes when you're reading the Word just for information, okay, just for information. As you read the Word of God, you're getting the information, and that information has to graduate into the heart. When it graduates into the heart as we read the Word of God, it becomes inspiration, okay? This is when knowledge or the information meets what is known as Sophia. And Sophia, is known to be wisdom. This is another way of saying wisdom. This is where we get the word philosophia. Philosophy, the love of wisdom. Philosophy, sophie represents wisdom. And we know that wisdom is important because the Bible says wisdom is a principal thing. So as we read the word for the information, it has to begin to come into the heart. Do you remember where the Bible begins to say, that thy word has I hid in my heart. So if the word stays in the head and doesn't penetrate the heart, what begins to start happening is that a spirit of religiosity will come and you become judgmental. Oh God, this is so good. You become judgmental. So when the word is only in the head and it has not palatated the heart, 
you become judgmental. And there was a season that they can only understand God through information. This was in the Old Testament. But when the New Testament comes and Christ begins to come, this is where we begin to see a coherence of the revelation coming into the heart. And this is that Christ's consciousness emerging in the believer or what is known as the indwelling Christ. This is why when we say invite Christ in, we don't say invite Christ into your head. You see how off that sounds? You see how even the religious people know that. We don't say invite Christ in your big toe. That makes no sense, okay? We say to invite him in your heart. Oh God, this teaching's already getting good. I need everyone to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button if you're enjoying this teaching because there's a lot of things that I'm talking about here. So when we understand, we read the word for information. And it's important that we understand the information because we need to know the information or the knowledge of the word. Because by us having the knowledge of the word, it protects our mind. It teaches us to protect our mind, which the mind is the battlefield. But that information has to graduate and come down and graduate into the heart. And the heart has to begin to take that information and begins to transpose it through the love of Christ and through what is known. And I'm not gonna get into this, but there's, a, there's, a, there's something called the etherization of the blood. And there's actually something that happens genetically to the genome to a believer when this begins to take place. And this is why we have communion. But when the word gets down into the heart, it begins to become what is known as the engrafted. Now the word has became engrafted into the spirit. And this begins to begin to bring what is known as inspiration. So first it started out as information, reading the word of God. You don't feel nothing, you're just reading, you're just gathering, okay. And Moses said this to Pharaoh, okay. In the beginning was the word and the word, okay. And then all of a sudden, as you're reading it more and more and more and more, and as the self or the ego begins to shed and the word begins to get into the heart, it becomes inspiration. Now I'm gonna teach you some techniques that you can do for the word to become engrafted. One of the best things that you can do, especially with the book of Proverbs, which is one of the first books I read, my mom told me that, powerful woman of God, is that you go to sleep listening to the word of God. Because while you're sleeping, the heart is not guarded and it's open. The heart, you become more subjective or subconscious. And so while you are sleeping, the word can get into your heart. And it starts to enter into the subjective mind or what is known as the heart, bringing heart coherence. And this is the one of the ways that the older prophets and how we would teach in my school, the prophets, how to get the word into the heart. And even though you're sleeping, you won't remember everything. But what it begins to do is that it invokes certain feeling states or vibrationary points in the body that the body begins to harmonize with, okay? So as we read the information of the word, the word begins to start coming up and it begins to get into the heart and it graduates, graduates into inspiration, in spiritation, in spiritation. Now it's very important. If this does not happen to someone, and the word stays in the head, the ego will take it and the ego will turn it into aspiration. Oh, Jesus, this is good. So what that means is that a lot of people who know a lot of the word, they will begin to start becoming prideful, egotistical, and that spirit of religiosity or that spirit of, I'm better than you because I know more scriptures. You can't do that. The Bible says this, the Bible says that, the law says this. And you have to understand, it is not by the law of Moses that we get in, or the law of the Word of God that we get in, because all of our feet are made out of clay. So it's not by the law. All of this religious religiosity all want to talk about the law and want to tell everyone who's going to hell. It is not the law that gets us in. It is His mercy that He begins to have for us filthy believers that gets us in. So in the past, it was by the law. It was by the law of Moses. We see the iconography of the law breaking, representing Christ coming 
to break the law to give us access to the kingdom. And I want to be clear here. There's a notion where people say, and I know that the dogmatic Christians are going to get mad, but I don't care because I'm going to give you the raw gospel. There's a notion that people believe if I sin, I cannot get into heaven because I sin, I cannot get into heaven. And the point of the matter is that what Christ did in Calvary is that he defeated sin. So it is not sin that can keep you out of heaven. It is your inability to invite Christ into your heart that can keep you out of heaven. Because if Christ is not in you, then you cannot fight back that spirit of sin. Okay, sin is the outer part. Let's talk about the inner part of the heart that did the sin. And that's the transformational part that the Bible is talking about. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ. This is Christ consciousness, people. So inspiration has to graduate from the knowledge. And we wanna make sure that it turns into information, that information turns into inspiration the correct way through the heart and it doesn't turn into aspiration where you aspire. That's what got Lucifer in trouble. He aspired. And so what happens is that you have a group, especially in the dogmatic Christians, you can turn on Christian TV, you see them all over there. There they talk and you can feel almost as if, man, they, they either make you feel or condemn you, or they make you feel as if you're dumb and you're going to hell. And all of this is because it is not coming from the inspiration of the word. It's coming from aspiration and it's a spirit of religiosity. And you have to be able to discern that. A lot of baby Christians cannot discern that, but you have to be able to discern it. And the key way to discern it is that if you don't fear the impulse of the Christ love, don't listen to it. If you don't feel the impulse of Christ's love, don't listen to it. Because here's the key thing. Even someone who's in sin, if you display Christ's love, you don't even have to condemn them. The Holy Spirit will convict them and they want to come back to right because wrong always has to come back to right. Oh God, this is good. After it goes and we talked about the word from information into the head. Now we're talking about the mirroring aspect of the word coming into the heart, the engrafted word. Thy word has he hid in my heart and it turning into inspiration. Then it goes into another aspect where when information and inspiration begins to mix. Oh God, this is going to be good. And then we're going to go into some scriptures. When inspiration and revelation begins to mix and they become one, what begins to happen is that it begins to birth something. And this is what births revelation. So revelation does not just come from inspiration. Revelation just doesn't become from, just doesn't come from information. Information, information and inspiration birth revelation. If you just have inspiration without the information, all it is is motivation. You ever see Christians like that, that are so motivated they're motivated for a lot. They want to really, they're on fire for God. They have a bunch of motivation, but there's no wisdom. There's no revelation. All they have is just inspiration. They're inspired, but they don't have the proper knowledge. So because they don't have the proper knowledge, it doesn't matter how much you listen to motivational speakers. This is why, this is the issue with the motivational movement or the movement of, oh, if you say this or the movement of, some of the move, some, I didn't say all, but some of the movement of this new thought movement where they say, if I think positive, things will happen. If I think positive, because what happens is that they are activating inspiration. They're doing things in the spirit, but there's not the proper information. The information is the word of God. So this is the issue. If you just do it off of inspiration and you just have faith, without the information, which is the works, it's dead. It's just motivation, it's just motivation. If you have just the information without the inspiration, what do you have? You're just, you just have history. 
You just have history. You just have knowledge. You are no different than a historian that talks about the Bible in the days of Christ. So you need the two because it is the information and inspiration that when they are mixed and when they come to an equal charge. And this really happens when coherence, and I teach this in my school, The Prophets, when the mind and the heart become coherent. When this begins to happen, this is when you start operating from revelation. Oh, hallelujah. May he give the people watching me revelation, Lord. May he give the people that are receiving right now, may the Lord give them revelation. May he give them revelation, Lord. Now, let's get into some scriptures here now. So when we talk about inspiration, inspiration comes from the Greek. It's from the Greek word that means God has breathed on you. Paul speaks a little bit about this in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 6. But now, brethren, if, and he speaks about this in this passage, he's actually referring to the language of tongues or the speaking into the spirit realm. And this is where the original language comes back to humanity when the Holy Spirit falls. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 6, it says, But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall it profit you unless I speak either by revelation? So if I'm speaking to you with inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and I'm not giving you the revelatory knowledge or the information graduating into revelation. He says, what does it profit you? By revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching. So this is the informational, the informational part or the revelational part, which is the wisdom aspect of it graduating. So when we talk about inspiration, this is when God begins to breathe on us. We begin to see this. And then in John, 16 verse 13 it gets it, and this is when the holy spirit touches us however when he the spirit of truth has come he will guide you into truth for he will not speak of his own authority but whatever he hears he will speak now this is very important i'm very careful and i don't and i, and I just want you to hear because i'm talking about this be very careful when people say that the holy spirit told me this the holy spirit said this about himself because the holy spirit does not speak about himself the same thing with the christ Jesus never spoke great about himself. Matter of fact, when they said and they called him good master, he says, no one is good but the father. So Christ will only speak of the father and the Holy Spirit will only speak of the son. This is very important for people to understand because there's some people that said the Holy Spirit said, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. What did you have for lunch? That's a spirit and it could be a demonic spirit, but that's not the Holy Spirit. OK, we know that because the Holy Spirit never talks about itself, never speaks about himself. OK, the Holy Spirit is not going to talk about where it was just at. Doesn't happen. The Holy Spirit never brags on itself either. All of these traits are egotism. And if you see that, that's a demonic entity or demonic spirit or a fallen angel. I want to go back here in John 16, verse 13. Put that on the screen because I want to talk about this because when information and inspiration marry each other, it becomes revelation. Put that on the screen. John 16, verse 13, because I want to break this down. So in John 16, verse 13, it says, however, when the spirit of truth, he has come, he will guide you into truth. That means he will give you this revelation. The truth is revelation. Truth is always revelation. Truth is not facts. Truth can always change facts, but facts cannot change truth. And so when you're operating from revelation, revelation can always change information, but information can never change revelation. Ah, Jesus. Now, it says, but will guide you into truth, but will be speaking not of his own, his own authority. So this is the key thing. He only speaks of the authority of the Christ and Christ only speaks of the authority of the father. If you've seen the son, then you've seen the father. Now, I want to go into the four aspects of understanding patterns in symb symbology of the Word of God. You have number one, repetitive patterns prophetically re repeating. This is seen in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9. It says, that which has been is what will be, that which is done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Now this is very important. Because what it, the Bible says here in the repetitive patterns prophetically in the Word of God is that whatever you have seen in the Bible, you're going to see it repeat again in the future. If you're able to understand the cycle, then you can predict 
what's to come. And this is very important in predicting what's going to happen in the coming of the Lord, what we're going to witness and what we're going to see the Lord do in the end time. Number two, repetitive historical patterns of civilization. This is social constructs. This is a very, very, very important part of understanding historical constructs. And we see this with, for example, the Tower of Babel. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 1 through 9, we see the Tower of Babel. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 5, 18, verse 2, Revelations 10, Revelation 21, we see what is known the mystery of Babel. So this is a repetitive pattern. So what Babel was, Babel was a tower, right? Babel was a tower. It was actually known as the gate of the gods, but this was a structure that was built so that people can communicate with the, with the fourth dimensional fallen entities and demons. This was something that was built after the flood. And we are going to witness this also in the end times. But I believe that this new Tower of Babel represents what people will be building through technology to try to do or what they would try to create through technocracy, a nation under a man-made system where God always wanted a theosophy, the, 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 a theocratic type of government, a nation that was under God. Two different things, but we're going to see it happening. So this is talking about historical patterns. Number three, repetitive language. This is another thing, linguistics. Now, word is very important because in the beginning was the word, right? The word vibrationary point was the Christ. But when we understand repetitive language fact, uh, this is things seen through words or rep repetition. So for example, in Rosh Hashanah, we understand that it is the festival of the trumpets. Exodus 19, verse 19, we begin to see the first sign of what would happen to the church. I'm going to read this to you. This is seeing repetitive narrative language. In Exodus 19, verse 19, it begins to say, And the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder. Moses spoke and God answered him by a voice. When you go on, it says, And Moses went up and God came down. Okay? So this is really a pattern of what is known as the rapture. The church will go up and God will come down. We will be caught in this heavenly dimension. So this is really, we're talking about the rapture. First Corinthians and also in Thessalonians, we see it as well. But in first Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all be asleep, but we shall be all changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. So. The trumpet that we see in Exodus 19, verse 19, is also the last trumpet of the Rosh Hashanah, where it is the longest trumpet, which is the last trumpet. So what we see in the iconography of Exodus 19, verse 19, is what will happen to the church, where the church will be collectively taken up and we will be caught up in the heavens with the Christ. Do you see that? So repetitive language, the trumpet, the long trumpet, it is the same type of trumpet, but this is a repetitive pattern. We're also going to see something called repetitive numerical patterns. Now, numbers have a big role. Numbers play out a lot with God. We see the numbers 40, for example. Remember where they are on the ark for what? 40 days, 40 nights. There's also other different numbers that we see, but I'll get into that in my other specific teaching on numbers. But we also see Jesus fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. So. We're seeing certain numbers that will repeat in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And why are these numbers important? Numbers are the first language to God. These are vibrationary points and these are how things are calculated. And so numbers was one of the gifts that God gave man so that he's able to calculate. So we're gonna see numerical patterns of numbers being also repeated. Seven, the earth was created in seven days, seven nights. They walked, around the ta uh, they walked around the walls for seven times. You see the number seven. There are seven covenants in the Bible. There are seven dispensations that we represent. There are seven stages of the church age. So we know that seven is a number that represents with the cycle of God. Seven and 12, these both are the numbers that represent cycles within God. Now, one of the things that we're going to see happen around the end time, and one of the things that we really get into the signs and understanding the signs is in Matthew 24, verse 3. The Bible begins to say, now as he sat on Mount Olive, this is Jesus, Jesus begins to give us some of the symbology of how we're going to know when the end time is coming. Now as he sat in the mountain of olives, the disciples came 
the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. That's the key part here. Now, many of the dogmatic Christians, I posted something that said, oh, prophet, that's wrong because the world is going to end. No, that's not what the Bible says. Even the disciples knew that. They were able to determine and they understood that it was not the end of the world as we know, but it represented what we would call the end of the age. Now, I want to go here very quickly. We're in Matthew 24. Matthew 24. I want to type this in here. In Matthew 24, verse 3. So I want to read this one more time because I want you to understand the social construct that Christ began to say. And he sat upon the mountain of olives and the disciples came up privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what shall be the sign of the coming of the end of the world, which world is another way of saying age. And Jesus and Jesus answered and said unto him, take heed, no man deceive you. So he says, do not be decep deceived because there is going to be deception that is going to be on the planet around the end time. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. When the Bible says that, I am, that, that many will come in my name and say, I am Christ, this is not saying that people, I used to always get baffled at that. I said, what does that mean? Does that mean that people are going to say, I'm Jesus, I'm Jesus? No. What that means is that Christ represents the Savior. So there is going to be a false religion that is going to be one of the end time religion. And this false religion is going to be the worship of technocracy or technology. One of the things that we're going to witness on the end time is that we're going to witness more and more of this push of civilizations and us understanding and us wondering about what else exists and what other entities are out there. This has been seen also in the Old Testament. Thank you, one of my partners just donated that's watching. This is also seen in the Old Testament when we begin to see the sons of God sleeping with the daughters of men. So one of the things that we're gonna see, we're gonna see a false religion. And this religion is gonna be a religion that is worshiping mammon and it's the religion of worshiping the mind. A religion that worships knowledge. And this is where we get into mechanicalism. And this is where we get into the worship of tech knowledge, which is only the iconography of the tree of knowledge. Now you understand what I'm saying? In the Old Testament, it was the giants that created this mixture, this mixture that hunted and tried to kill. Whereas in the new or in this age, it will be the tech giants that will do the same thing. Tech giants, giants, it's the same thing. So there's going to be a religion and a religion that worships materialism. We're going to see more of that. There's going to be an idea of how can we upload our consciousness on computers? How can we put our consciousness on, on devices? How can we upload this? All of this thing is deceptive and it is the Antichrist because it is about trying to transpose or transfigure the holy human form of the body. Whereas Christ is saying we are not supposed to be changing the outer, we need to change the inner. The kingdom of God is within us and it should bubble out until it changes the outer form. But we're going to see people wanting to change the form from the outside in, whereas believers will be being transformed from the inside out. He begins to go on and says, And ye shall hear wars, verse 6, Matthew 24, verse 6, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that ye are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Then it goes on to say, verse 7, for nation shall rise against nations and kingdoms against kingdom, and there shall be a famine, pestilence, earthquakes in divers places. Now, this is very key thing here because this is where it talks about wars, battles, pestilence means viruses. That's actually what pestilence means. It means viruses. Are we not watching this happening? Have we not watched the whole world shut down over a pestilence? This is going to be happening. So there's going to be a lot more mutations. There's going to be a lot more ethnic. Now, when the Bible talks about nations, now it says something, nations shall rise against nations and kingdom against kingdoms. In the Greek, it comes from ethnos. So what that means is that there's going to be ethnic wars. 
wars from racial groups, wars that will take place against white and black women and men, um, wars that will be taking place with different social constructs. All of this is written here. Now in Matthew chapter 24, verse 10, it goes on to the next part that we're going to see happening. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. This talks about offenses. So now we're going to see something where everyone is going to be offended. Everyone's going to, have we not watched Me Too movement? Have we not watched people? I'm not saying this stuff is not true, but we're going to see people becoming highly where you have to be careful. You can't say this word. You can't say that word. The cancel culture culture. This is what this is talking about. Many shall be offended talks about the cancel culture. If you say one thing, we're canceling you because we're offended. We don't like that. This is part of what would take place, this hypersensitivity and this one, uh, this not understanding of another perspective. If you say something in a way that I don't understand, I'm offended, we're canceling you. This is what is happening, people. So why is it important that we understand this? People, it's important that we understand this because as we read the word, and Christ goes on to say, just like during the days of, just like the days of Noah, so shall it be the coming of the Lord. We must understand these patterns because these patterns are repeating. And I'm just showing you some of this because this is some stuff that you can do on your own. So what am I challenging some of you to do? My dear precious partners and those that are watching, my lovely partners, we have partners that have been following this ministry over 10 years, 20 years since I was a teenager ministering. I have some partners that's been following me for that long. What, what must we do? I challenge every one of you to pay attention to the patterns. Pay attention to the narrative language patterns in the Old Testament. Pay attention to the, the, social, the social patterns. Pay attention to the historical patterns. And pay attention to the numerical patterns. Because all of these things we're going to see repeating at the end time. And it is important that we pay attention to this because the Bible says even the very elected, even the very elected will be fooled during the end time. As we pay attention to these patterns, that's when you're going to be able to get the revelation of saying, ah, I know what's about to come. I know what's about to happen. Now, not a lot of people are teaching this, but this is the way how you decode it and this is how you break it. I'm teaching, but I'm teaching you how to do it yourself. So the four patterns that you pay attention to, repetitive patterns prophetically repeating. Number two, historical patterns. Hallelujah, I feel it, a tremendous anointing. Narrative language patterns. And number four, numerical patterns. I feel such an urge to pray for someone right now. If you got blessed from this, from this I want you to go ahead and sow something prophetically because I'm believing God to raise $22 million to build the center for the School of the Prophets. We are in the end times and we're about to see one of the greatest shakings. We're about to see a new religion of materialism that's going to come. We're going to start hearing a falling gospel of extraterrestrial and this technology hidden behind this materialis materialistic gospel that's going to be. We're going to start seeing the exaltation of machinery we're going to see the exaltation of this mark of the beast that the Bible speaks about that will be on the screens. We're going to see this. We're going to also see Nazism beginning to come on the rise. And one of the things that was demonic about Nazism is that they were into different forms of what was known as, 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 as a demonic form, which was known as getting information from the other side and so they were into alien worshiping and doing stuff with planets. And we're going to see this come back. This is esoteric Nazism that we're going to see. And we're going to begin to see hate groups emerge. We're going to begin to see this belief that extraterrestrial created us, created us. You're going to start hearing more and more of this because people are going to seek more into materialism. And as they do this, there's going to be a push and an advance of the mixture of the human genome with technology. In the days of Noah, it was the mixture of the fallen angels with man. In this day and age, it's going to be the mixture of the fallen angels' machinery with man. And these fallen angels' machinery are known as extraterrestrial. 
and they are going to speak a different gospel. This is why the Bible says, if any angel speaks of a different gospel, let them be a curse. I'm going to challenge everyone to sow into the kingdom, partner with heaven right now. I'm going to ask every person to do a $70 seed. Seven is a number of completion. There's some that will do 77, 170, 1,070, $20.70. I want everyone to do a seed of completion. Anything that's going on, I want us to sow into the kingdom, sow into the gospel. Do your best seed, do it quickly. Father, I ask you right now, Lord, even as they heard this message and even as they heard this word, Lord, we break every attack of the enemy. We call things that be not as though they were. And we ask you, Lord, to place an anointing on them that allows them to walk with your revelation. Give them the information, graduate it to inspiration as we spoke, and now give them the revelation where they walk with wisdom. This I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Remember, you want to watch to cover your mind and you want to pray. Oh God, this is such an anointing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, to cover your spirit.